Okay, so welcome back. Here we are in the second part, second part of four, for chapter 13, uh, triangle nodes and quadrilateral nodes. So what we've done so far is look at the common fields and the motivation for uh, why do we have uh, uh, quadrilaterals, triangles, how are the basics applied consistently to these nodes. And now we're going to look at what do normals do for us? The normal perpendicular vectors and uh, the normal node that captures them. And then we'll look at uh, our first application of this, and this would be in the triangle set node. Okay, so uh, we've gone through the right-hand rule and how do we compute those. And uh, the normal per vertex field, which would say, do I need a normal definition for each vertex in a node, each point of the triangle, or can a single normal vector apply to each polygon of a triangle set that we put together? Okay, so similarly defined to uh, color per vertex. Uh, if it's true, then the number of normal vectors that are defined equals the number of points in there. If the value is false, then the number of normals must equal or be greater to uh, the number of polygons that's in there. Okay. Let's uh, pay some close attention now to uh, quadrilaterals and what happens if they're non-planar. For one thing, uh, if they're non-planar, you no longer have a single normal for that, and um, it doesn't work very well. Uh, if we instead have uh, uh, triangles, we avoid this problem completely. But if we are using uh, quadrilaterals, then we have to be careful that we don't have this uh, ambiguity situation, which we've illustrated here in this. And the ambiguity comes from the fact that, uh, well, if we do it on the left, it's did we draw the perpendicular, the uh, tessellation one way, or did we draw the tessellation a second way uh, uh, from these two diagonals right here. So this one, if we draw it here, then that would be the same as this version of it. If we instead draw to the opposite diagonals like that, then our two triangles would look from that. Now obviously, these two examples are different. They're also non-coplanar. And as a result, they'd be unpredictable. They'd be ambig ambiguous and inconsistently rendered by different X3D viewers or different hardware cards. Even using the same viewing software, if you're on a different system, the hardware might say, well, do I go left? Do I go right? I didn't get enough information here. Which split should I do? Ambiguity is bad. Because we would like to have consistent results. So best way to do that is uh, if the question is, Doctor, doctor, my arm hurts when I go like this. Well, uh, you can pay a lot of money, but they'll probably tell you, uh, don't go like that. Okay, so that's what I'm telling you. Don't go like that. Avoid this case and make sure that you have planar quadrilaterals. Now, it's one thing to say things. Uh, go out and do good things. It's another to actually do them. So let's take a look at this uh, particular case. Uh, here we go. It's our model uh, non-planar polygons. And let's see, that is in uh, this chapter, chapter 13, non-planar polygons. Okay, so uh, here we are. And how did we define this? Well, first we did a uh, point set and then a line set uh, to uh, connect them, just the outline of the polygon. Let's let's uh, let's bring out this picture a little more, and that might make it more evident. If we rotate this around, 
okay, I'm driving the display now, dragging it. We look above, we can see that sure enough, those four points are not planar. In fact, they're absolutely exaggerated. We can also see, just as we did in the other picture, that we have two different ways of tessellating those triangles. Let's have a little fun now with X3D Edit before we uh, fiddle much more with that. I think this diagram might actually be a little better if we put the, uh, the line drawing twice, once above each different tessellation, and it will be a little easier to draw that. So let's take a look at the scene and see if we can't do that. So uh, this would be a good excuse to put def nodes, def and use, so we can uh, just quickly copy the new thing. And they're not in there, so let's figure that out. Here's our first transform. Here's our second one. We are reusing the points. Uh, and so that's an index face set. Index face set. Uh, let's take a look here. obviously a different order, so why don't we experiment a little bit. We can quickly hide, we've seen a trick in the past for hiding, you can either use comments or uh, you can use an LOD node. So why don't we try it with each. Let's take our first group and comment this out and see if that works. Okay, comment, comment, okay, now I want to check validation here. Where the comment trick doesn't work is if there were any embedded comments. You can't have an XML comment inside an XML comment. Looks like we're clear on that score here. Validation will tell us that's good. Okay, so let's redraw this thing and see what we have. And XJ3D is not so good at refreshing. So let's look at it in an external player. Oh, and we'll fix that XJ3D error, by the way. There's uh, yet another dev release out, and we'll probably uh, update that shortly. Okay, so, hmm, looks different. I'm not sure what I got rid of there. Uh, Maybe that was extraneous. I doubt it, but... Uh, oh, I see. It worked, but that's because I didn't save. Okay? So I made a change with commenting, but I need to save it up here. So let's save it and re-render. File, reload. Okay, so what we've isolated in the scene is the wireframe drawing. If you look very closely, this might not be visible on the video, but I can see it on my display here, and that is the original points that were drawn are still visible. And uh, why is that? It's because uh, they are def used, and our initial point set got obscured by that wire wireframe, but they're still in there. So what I can now do is say, okay, this group right here, I'm ready to give a name, so let's uncomment it, let's bring it back into the game, and we're going to call this group our uh, uh, line outline. So why don't we call it outline with exaggerated points? because we do have those balls on the end, okay? And uh, this is exactly the piece I wanted to get to. So I just save that, and we hit reload, and we say, okay, good, we didn't break this scene. Now what I want to do is, now that it's deft, I want to uh, make a copy of it. And so what we'll do is uh, take this geometry and move it over here, so it's on top of the one, 
and then we'll make an exact same copy and translate it over here so that our figure is a little easier to draw the lines on which one is which. Okay, let's do that. So now that we have that, we're going to need to transform this group to align with the first set of geometry. And if we look down here, we can see, okay, there is our geometry right here. So let's put a transform over it. And I'm going to copy that value, translation value of negative 2 along the x-axis. So to get this in here, we will wrap a new parent around the element. What's the new parent? Well, a transform, of course. And here we go. So translation 0, 0, uh, excuse me, negative 2, 0, 0, I think it was. Yeah, negative 2, 0, 0. So there's our parent transform. Everything validated, so that's good. You can see it kept our thing there. So now what do we want to put? Well, right, on, right next to that, right on the other side, I want to add another transform. So we'll drag that in, and we'll put this at positive 2 on the right-hand side of the view. And what is our children that we want to put in there? Well, we want to put in a copy of that prior group. Okay, so there's our group. Rather than try to remember the name, I'm simply going to edit it. And uh, we'll say, this is going to be a use node. See how it's grayed out there. It's already predicting. Oh, I know what you might want. You might want that guy right there. So let's switch it from a def to a use. Let's double check. Sure enough, it's only showing us the grouping nodes that matter rather than every node that might be def used. Okay, good. So def use, and we should have a copy on the other side directly over the first. I saved it. Let's reload. Hey, look at that. Okay. So now I can take this picture and either draw on the left side, showing that scene, or on the right side, showing that scene. There's our deaf views. There's a term in computer science that we call refactoring. which says take something you have and factor it, change it around a little bit differently to make it more efficient. So we could say, what's one more thing we could do to this scene that we've just edited to refactor a little better? Well, we could say the transforms for each, one over the other, why did we duplicate those? Maybe we should just move one to the other and make sure we did it right. So let's go back into our scene and say, uh, uh, that was our set of points. And uh, we'll give this guy a def just for comment purposes. Uh, this will show our points. So I can hide that now. We don't need to pay attention to that and say, here was our transform that uh, moved it to negative 2. Here is our transform that moved it to positive 2. Uh, nope. Mistake. I put that at the wrong place. Here was a simple shape here. Uh, that was the shape node. So we'll call that simple point shape. Maybe simple shape for the points. We're simply simple points. Okay? This is how we do it. We're showing you a practical example here, not how smart can you be on the first pass, but rather what's the thought process as we refine and improve a scene. Okay, given that that shape we can leave alone. Now here was our exaggerated outline group. So let's take that guy and 
cut it and we want to move it from this uh, plus 2 to that minus 2. Oh, I think I see the problem here. Actually, uh, we should have kept those simple points inside the first one rather than have them end up in the middle. So, we put that there. The simple points so they're in the right place. And now, we'll move our outline with exaggerated points. Move that group. Let me just double check something. Are we still valid? Yes, I haven't messed up anything in my cut and paste. So that group, we're going to cut and move it to be under the 200. Excuse me, the negative 200. And then we're going to cut our use of that. Remember, it has to follow. So we're going to move that to be under our other transform node at positive 200. Zero, zero. Okay, so a little, little black magic here. Save it, redraw, see if we've broken it. Okay, well, uh, we refactored it, but maybe too well. It's superimposed not what we wanted. We wanted it up above. It's kind of a curious effect, but wrong. So let's undo all that. Push it back. I think four undos will do the trick. Save, redraw, sure enough, there it is. So could we refactor this a little more? Yeah, probably. Could we break it when we refactor it? Yes. <laughs> That's the name of the game, or the nature of the game. So uh, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead here, and we'll leave it uh, uh, in this form, because this does look exactly like what we want. It does let us draw the picture a little bit better to emphasize it like that. And we've gotten some good practice in refactoring. And also in def and use so that we can improve, simply improve a diagram. Okay? So I hope you found that little uh, interlude useful. Since we have a good example now, the Work's not done until we fix the paperwork, so today is the 14th, and hey, look at that, it's still 2008, thank goodness, and not 2009 yet. So we'll save that, and I'll check it into version control, and say why we want to improve the display to show the wireframe twice. Okay, so it's not a bug fix, but a feature improvement. And there we go. Okay, now back to the slides. Now that we've thoroughly pounded this example into the ground, see what we can do with it. All right. Uh, Next up, what are common features and what are different features for the nodes in this chapter? And when we say these nodes, we're talking about the triangle nodes and the quadrilateral nodes in this chapter. Okay, so uh, first, something that's always common is where do the points go? They go in child coordinate nodes. In some cases, you might want to use double precision. This is typically only needed if we're geographically mapping something, but you might want to use that. Coordinate double is an allowed substitute for coordinate node. They're exactly the same in your scene. They look the same. One's just called coordinate double, and it's treated with double precision, higher accuracy 
ordinarily that's far beyond anything that your graphics card will need to show. Okay, another similarity is that the colors will be in a, similarly in a child node, and that will be either in a color or a color RGBA. If you recall, the A in RGBA stands for alpha, which equals one minus the transparency. Okay, so our alpha is um, uh, something if we want to have partial transparency either on a polygon basis or a vertex basis, we can get very fancy about that with our color RGBA nodes. And then we can um, also put in child nodes for the normal vectors and for texture coordinates. If we want to slice out the associated texture and get just pieces of that applied to each, there's a texture coordinate node for doing that. What else is common between all these triangular and rectangular nodes? Well, our, our basic fields. Counterclockwise, convex, solid, color per vertex, normal uh, per vertex. And actually, uh, here's a mistake. Convex is a historic node uh, attribute, but we don't need convex uh, because, uh, at least for our triangles, we don't have convex triangle. Uh, you can't have a, a concave triangle. It's not geometrically possible. Let's confirm in the spec. However, maybe you could conceivably have a convex quadrilateral. Uh, so let's see if I can draw a convex quadrilateral. Okay, there's one right there. How do you know it's, uh, excuse me, not convex, but concave? Let's try again. Okay, let's draw a concave, meaning it has a cave. Well, point, 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 concave. It is possible to draw a concave quadrilateral. So let's double check there if our convex, convex true means no caves, convex false means concave, could have a cave. How would we confirm that? We go into the uh, spec, which you can get uh, easily online, or install it locally, or you've got it in your uh, X3D edit. I'm just going to go to my local bookmark here. And drill down on this guy. Here's our definition for convex field. Let's go out to our uh, CAD geometry component where we'll find this node. In fact, let's just look up the node that we're interested in. Node index in the X3D spec. We'll go look at Quadset, one of our nodes in this uh, chapter. Quadset or index Quadset, here we go. And Sure enough, no concave, no convex. Okay, so attention to detail is the key in this chapter. So I think we should uh, first fix this guy, and second, uh, make sure that would be a good warning in there. Make sure that your um, polygons stay convex and not concave when you define quads. Okay, charging on. What else uh, can we find out in these nodes that's co common between them? Well, uh, the index. The index is used for the index versions. That's a common construct. We've even seen it before. 
in the index base set. And sometimes we use negative ones, sometimes we don't. It depends. Okay, so that's a, con a caution here. And that's where our common characteristics still have a little bit of difference. All right, now what other differences can we really point out between these nodes? Well, first of all, uh, color values, uh, if they are used with the ordered node set, we have uh, the same order when you're reading the coordinates will be used when we read the corresponding color values. It'll just march through the child node in order for points and for colors, either on a per vertex or a per polygon basis. Okay, and then uh, if we're uh, using indices, it's also the same order of indices. We don't have multiple index fields, which is good because it's confusing or challenging enough already to do the indexing of which triangle point goes where. If the colors were a different index, boy, that would make it doubly hard. So we don't give you that uh, rope to hang yourself with. Instead, we simply say same order, whether it's uh, the explicit order uh, defined in how they're there or the indexing of how to point to them. All right, so there's the ground rules. Let's apply this to a node now. And um, uh, the first note is normal. The normal, again, is not usual or ordinary, but rather the perpendicular. How uh, we compute those perpendiculars to make sure things work. And the reason this has been pushed back all the way to chapter 13 in the book, all the way to the end, is normally we don't need them. We don't have to bother with them. If you think about it, since every triangle, be it a triangle definition in one of these nodes or a triangle from a tessellation of any geometry, since every single triangle going to the graphics card defines uniquely a plane, then that means they also uniquely have a normal vector, a perpendicular direction to each and every triangle. Oh, and since those are fixed, since they're computable, that can be computed at runtime when it gets down to the graphics rendering software in your browser, when it gets to the hardware. We don't have to do that as authors. Okay, so all done. Except when you want to add them. All right, so this is where we finally learn in, in, near the end of the book here is that option is available to you if you want to vary those definitions and use them for your own special effects to make it work. It might conceivably also reduce the, uh, the uh, initial startup time for your scene, but that's a, a tricky trade-off. And let's make sure we got the uh, right slide that computes that. Actually, we have a special slide on that in a few slides down. So, because there's this trade-off of, do I pre-compute them? Do I compute them at runtime? Do I put them in the scene and make the scene bigger and make the download time longer? Or do I increase the computation time when it's first loaded? That's not a, a bipolar optimization. There are several factors to consider there. So, our default is, ah, let the computer do the work right before it starts drawing, let it compute there. So we don't worry about those. But we can, and whether that might get faster or slower, for certain scenes that have lots of geometry or lots of special effects, that's up to authors to decide, and the best way is through experimentation. Okay, so here we go, normal note, and uh, uh, it lets us do that. Let's take a look at some of these effects. Why would we bother? Why would we care about normal nodes? Well, uh, some of this is review from how does lighting work in the scene. And the basic notion is 
we're computing light rays from a source and they're getting bounced off geometry and they're coming back to the user's viewpoint. So that viewpoint, geometry, light source, incident, exiting, angle of, uh, angle of incidence, angle of reflect, reflection, and then the change in, in intensity as, as things bounce and, and attenuate with distance. This is what all the math is doing in the X3D browser. This is the emulation of optics that's going on. So let's jump ahead one slide to the picture that shows this. And the basic issue is our light source is coming into each triangle of geometry and then going back to our viewpoint, which is really a screen. And our screen is computing itself pixel by pixel by pixel. It's painting that image as if it were in front of you. And that's the viewer's top of his view frustrum, what they see. Okay, so before we dissect this figure further, let's go back to the description then. Uh, what are the effects again? Well, we have incident and reflected vectors from the light source to the view frustrum screen that's being drawn. Now, given that we're drawing that off a of surface polygon, how do we compute those angles? Well, guess what? We compute it by the normal vector. Okay, so if we change that normal vector, if we move it one way or another, then we can change how much of the light, the highest intensity of the light goes in one direction or another, and increase or reduce the light that actually comes back to the viewer's eye point. Okay, so that's what this describes right here. Uh, and of course, there's more prose on this in the book. Uh, but the, the basic notion is illustrated in the diagram, maybe a little more easily than can be shown in the words, which is if we take our, our baseline normal, the one that's actually perpendicular, then we see what the expected light would be, and we get a normal viewing of what's shown. However, we can change this. We can modify the vector. And if we move the vector away from the light source, then we see less. OK, and that would be option B right here. If we move the vector towards, Here's the vector getting moved towards, from straight up and down towards the light source, then we get more light. See, So if we think about that, how does that work? Well, if we take a, a plane surface and examine it uh, uh, right here with light in, in, in the room that I'm in, the light is basically up above. There's a couple of lights in the overhead. And so if we take this and it's at sort of an oblique angle, it's, it's moderately lit. But if we rotate it to face the light, it gets more light. Why? Because the light is coming straight on. So the normal vector is now pointing at the light. That means it's reflecting most of it right back towards the viewer, in this case, the camera. But as I rotate this plane, as I turn it away from the light, more and more, the, the normal vector is also turning away from the light, and the direction of highest reflection is now farther and farther away. So it's not that it's not just that there's less of the plane to see here, but it's also that much of the light is reflected. So you should be seeing this get dimmer and dimmer. Uh, it doesn't completely disappear, but it's not as intense as when we fully face on. The, the polygon to greatly reflect it, okay? So what we're doing in this figure then, where we modify the normal, where we rotate it back towards the light or away from the light, and we see that it really gets, uh, let's redraw this. If I use red to be more intense, 
higher intensity. And C, we've taken the normal vector and we've gone from A to C in that direction. In B, we've got lower intensity by rotating the vector away from A to B. Okay, towards or away, more light facing the cure. Okay, he goes, hey, wait a minute, that's not real. The perpendicular is always going to be in one place in the real world. Correct. It's not real. It's an effect we can take advantage of if we say those normals are in a target of opportunity. There's something that we could animate or change to maybe enhance to emphasize the brightness of an object, or de-emphasize, to hide that a little bit. So it's a special effect that we might take advantage of here. Okay, so graphics uh, uh, effect, what else do we need to know about this? Well, we said earlier that the perpendicular Usually it doesn't matter what the magnitude of it is. We want it to be a unit length of one. So here's a jargon check for you. Make sure you, you understand which term. Unit normalization means magnitude of one. Normal means perpendicular. Okay. So let's try that again. Normalization means unit length. Normal vector means uh, perpendicular. If that's too red and blue for you, well, let's, let's see if I can get this tool to cooperate here. Let's try it one other way. Unit normalization is unit length. Normal vector is perpendicular. I'm sure you say, all right, all right, all right, three times is way too much. There you go. But be clear. So whenever you hear that word, listen twice and say, what, what did they say? Which one is it? Okay. Now the map to do this is actually quite simple. And it's an ex a variation on uh, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, which says uh, for right triangles, uh, how do we compute the vector of that? Well, you can think of this as the Pythagorean theorem uh, in three dimensions because what we do is we take the x, y, z, square them, and then take the uh, square root, and that gives us the length, the distance of that third side, of the big side. And so if we take that value then, and uh, uh, we'll call that value r, and we apply r by dividing it into the original x, y, z vector, then we get our modified coordinate, our modified normal. Each of those numbers will be between the values of uh, 0 and 1, inclusive. The main thing we want to avoid, make sure we can't have, is a 0 0, 0, 0 vector is bad because that would be called degenerate or erroneous, degenerate being a mathematical term. Okay, so here's how we compute the actual values if we need it. Uh, usually, the graphics cards will let you slide and do that, but if you're preparing normals, if you're computing them, you should normalize them. It's a good practice and it will improve, uh, possibly improve the, the startup and performance of, of your state. Okay, for this normal node, the node called normal, we do have uh, some hints and warnings. Now, we've looked at this before. The trade-off of pre-computing normals and putting them in your scene versus just using the normals that are there is kind of complicated. 
it's it's a do we take advantage of the very fast hardware on the on the on the user's uh, display, or do we pre-process it at the cost of bloating the file and increasing uh, bandwidth? Usually, it's a very easy trade-off. Even though it's more than one thing, usually it very much favors that very very fast hardware over that maybe not so fast network. However, if you want to do a special effect, then Absolutely, you have to compute the normal. You want it in there. That is your effect. And uh, still, there's even further trade-offs. If you're pre-animating it, then how can you most efficiently pre-compute more than one normal if you're changing the normal as part of what you're showing? Okay, so you probably have noticed there's no simple gotcha answer on this slide. Rather, it's expressing the trade-offs the hints. And usually you have to go through this thought process yourself when you want a special animation with normals. We do have an example scene showing this and the arrows on this uh, screen are not shown in the scene itself. Rather, these are the normals that are defined at each of those points. A good exercise if you're really paying attention to how do I construct a normal is go into the scene and look at each one of those and uh, examine it. So let's go to the scene and we'll go to our normal node example and we'll go down to our normal node itself and we can see that okay we had some coordinate points defined up here in the scene and then uh, next to that we had a normal. So let's, let's get our window for XJ3D up to show what this scene looks like. Okay, so there we have two uh, triangles rendered with and without normals, and they certainly look different. It got darker in parts because the normal uh, is pointing away from the light source. And you can see the coloring change on these triangles as we rotate them because uh, back on the bottom here, these normals are pointing in unusual directions and that means the effect of the light is treated differently. So here's our normal node in the scene. If we edit that, we see that oh, pretty straightforward. It's just a bunch of XYZ vectors and since we just used uh, pointing along axes, so they're all zero to one on these guys. Uh, so we have 18 vectors to cover all the different points in there. Uh, the only other thing to look at is uh, our index triangle strip set. We'll say, uh, sure enough, normal per vertex is uh, how this one, this particular scene is working. And uh, there you go. There's an effect, very simple effect of what normals can look like and it's illustrated in this figure screen snapshot with vectors superimposed. Okay, very simple normal and then here's our scene that we just inspected.